Uh, welcome to my session on developer experience. I know there is another session about developer experience going on at the same time, so thanks for choosing my talk. I hope the other person is having a good time as well. Uh, yeah, my session is going to be on developer experience and kind of retelling what we did in the past half year to optimize for play early on and the conclusions we draw from that and how you can apply those lessons for your own preferably open source project. Now, why talk about developer experience at all? In most business settings, developer experience is something that happens in a close-knit team. You have your developers, you have your team lead, they all work together to achieve one common goal. And you have retrospectives. You can take a look at what went well, what didn't went well, where we can optimize the code, where we can optimize deployments. Kind of all areas of developer experience all happen in this small team. Now, for open source, it's not that easy. You usually have a core contributor team. You have people who recently get, uh, re regularly get together and talk about the state of the software overall. But if you want to attract new contributors to your project, you don't know about them until they contact you. And if you have a big hurdle of entry to even contact you or contribute to your project, that can be detrimental. And ideally, you want more people contributing. So putting effort into developer experience can really pay off. And yeah, it's kind of a bit more difficult to do in open source, but there are still ways you can optimize to get more people contributing. And what I want you to take away from this talk is just to take a moment to reflect on your project and see, are there any improvements we can take from a developer experience perspective? Is there something we can do to make it more fun to work on this project? Now, my job title is developer experience engineer. And I'm kind of in the middle of this entire journey, since we as Grafana Labs, we provide tooling to ease the developer experience, to help the developers. So we don't only want to have developers have a good time contributing to our software, but we also want to help developers develop their own software. So I'm in the middle of that, and my goal is it to make it easier for developers and site reliability engineers to work with our tools. Now, a few pain points we've identified were that we had a lot of different demos and a lot of different tutorials using different data sets, and all of those tutorials required the user to go into an application, set something up for themselves, figure out the steps of how to send data to Grafana, how to then visualize that later on, and kind of go through this with your real application. This is fine for more experienced people, but less experienced people, they usually don't want to take their time to set up yet another instance. And then those instructions are outdated and suddenly nothing works anymore. And while you just wanted to visualize how much CPU usage your cluster is using, you're now, you're now stuck debugging certificate issues in Kubernetes. And we don't want that. We want people to have a good experience. We want especially developers to have a good experience. Now, what did we do to address this? Over the past half year, we developed a tool called Demo Data Dashboards, which is a demo environment for our core stack. This is a plugin installed into, in Grafana itself. This allows you to uh, get started with Grafana without having to instrument your own application. You can try this out. You can sign up for a, a cloud account. It's in there by default. You can check out different demos. We have demos optimized for general purpose use cases like visualizing the weather, visualizing a generic SRE, a generic SRE stuff, but also more application-focused things like application observability, Kubernetes integration, kind of showcasing what our entire system can do. And in the end, it's nothing you couldn't do yourself. Like You can go uh, into Grafana yourself and build all of this on your own with your own application, but you will need to spend some time instrumenting your application and figuring out how to then visualize this in a nice way. And by introducing this system, we've enabled users to sign up and get started right away to see what value they can get out of our, our solutions. Now, it's not only developers and SREs who use this to get a feel for the system overall. It has also shown very valuable to our sales folks who are using this at customers who go, uh, OK, can you show me what you're actually doing? So they spin up a new instance, use the same data, run through their sales routine, and can reuse this. On the other side, it's also very valuable to our internal developers. At Grafana Labs, we have regular hackathons where everyone in the company just gets together in small groups and hacks on whatever they like. 
And for those presentations, it's always uh, great for me to see people using this data as a baseline for their enhancements, for their new features, because again, they didn't have to think about setting this up on their own, and they can just use it and get, get started quickly. And this kind of experience made me realize this focus on play and enabling people to start out with your application early on without having to put much effort in yourself can be a really useful guiding principle for developer experience overall. If you've never had any re uh, retrospective about your developer experience, I propose you keep in the back of your head, we will optimize for people to get started quickly. Now, obviously, that's easier said than done. You need to do something to your system or software yourself, otherwise, this just won't work. But by asking the right questions, like how can we make this easier, this is something that's achievable for every project, I think. Now, the rest of the slides will be biased towards uh, web applications, but most of the steps are the same thing for command line tooling or even uh, like games, I guess. But yeah, I just wanted to keep that in mind that uh, most of my experience comes from web-based tooling, but you should be able to apply this to any other system as well. Now, the first thing I want you to do is delete your project. I want you to go ahead and delete just your whole entire project folder. Obviously, I don't want you to delete your software and give up on your dreams, but I just want you to delete your locally checked out version. And then you're going to clone it again and try to get it into a running state again. Now, while you're doing that, take a moment to reflect how long does it take you to get to a state where you can start developing new features again. Have a timer ready if you want to, and try to with every roadblock you encounter where you're like, ah, okay, I forgot to do this, see if it's documented somewhere. Make sure that this works for you. And at the end, you will arrive at a time which will probably not be too long, but keep in mind that that is for someone who has worked with the project before. Now imagine someone starting out and they have never even used the programming language. They just wanted to fix a small bug and they're stuck there for half an hour trying to even get some kind of output. And yeah, at the end, you should have a list of things, or at least a list of times, how long did it take to set it up? And afterwards, ask yourself, what can I do to improve that? So one easy thing you can take a look at is, what kind of steps did you actually need to take to compile your software, to get a usable artifact out of your code? Now, one assumption that many projects take, yeah, yeah, it's trivial. We're using Go, so you just need to uh, do Go build and you will have a binary. Yeah, we're using TypeScript, so just use yarn run or install. And at that point, you already made an assumption. Like, no, not everyone is using yarn. Not everyone is using NPM. Some people use PNPM. Some people never used JavaScript in their life before. Even if you think it's trivial for someone to get started with your software, make sure it's documented somewhere. I can't tell you how often I encountered Python projects which I didn't manage to set up because I didn't know what package management they were using. I had to dig through the files and figure out, hmm, okay, this Py project, is this, is this, what kind of package manager are we talking about? So make sure this is documented. This is just a callback to the old days where it was just like implicitly, yeah, you need to run the configure script and then make, but those things were often also not documented. Make sure it's documented. And while you're at it, Check out if this build script, if your dependencies take a lot of space. Because while most of the time you have a fast internet connection, you know most people have a fast internet connection, you have a nice connection at your office, you have a nice connection at home, but what if you ever need to work from a train? If you were to check out this code base, then you would have three and a half gigabytes of dependencies alone, and you're sit sitting there waiting for those to download, which is time you could spend elsewhere. Now, obviously, I'm not saying it's trivial to just rip out all your dependencies. You will need them, but maybe it makes, time, uh, makes sense from time to time to check in and see, hmm, do we really need that dependency? Why is this dependency downloading one gigabyte of machine learning models? We don't even use AI. Like, make sure you actually use your dependencies and consider doing some of that in your code base. And once the project is compiled, also make sure you document how to run it. I realize those slides are a bit small, but in the end, those are instructions how to run Grafana, for example. In this case, we need to start a backend server and a frontend server. So make sure you document 
if you have to have multiple parts of your software running at once. And one nice thing about this example, it's also in there like common errors you will encounter if you have a specific machine setup, like you're having problems with too many open files, document those as well. Because if you ran into them at some points, the chances are high that someone else will also encounter this issue. And in the end, again, document everything. Document why these commands are even needed, because for someone starting out in web development, it might not make sense why you have to start a separate process for your backend and a separate process for your front end. Document how you can proceed after that. Document how you can access this, this software. Also started countless of projects would say, okay, service running, great. But I had no idea where to reach that service because it didn't tell me where to reach that. So I had to look at my open ports and figure out where exactly this went wrong. Now, oh, cool. Now, your user knows how to compile and start your application for the first time. You're done, right? Let's give it to them, and they'll figure it out on their own. Well, obviously, if that were the case, then my talk would be very short, and I have some slides left, so you're not yet done with your developer experience. You need to make sure that those people who just started the software have something to do with it as well. And the best way to do that is to provide useful test data can come in the form of examples or golden files for CLI tools. You want to have some example data of what your project can do uh, or what data your project takes and how it can modify that in some shape or form. One project which I really appreciate is GoToSocial. It's a uh, ActivityPub server and they have a separate mode for starting the application which is called test rig mode. And in that mode, the entire instance gets started with a useful test data, a real social graph between people or fictional people, turtles and video game characters in that case, but they have relationships to each other and it's not just placeholder, foo, bar, uh, example data. So make sure you provide useful data because in the end, this data that you're presenting here, that will influence how people use your software overall. So make sure you follow your own best practices while providing them with useful data. One cool thing about this test rig mode is also that it doesn't use any external dependencies. So while in production, you would use a real database, this uses an in-memory database. It doesn't use any caching. It doesn't use any message bus or any other complicated third-party system you have to set up. You can just start it on its own and get a feel for the system overall. A nice side effect of that is once you have this data in there, you can do end-to-end -end testing. Because end-to-end -end testing is, in my opinion, the best kind of test because it offers you confidence that your core workflow is still working. To provide a different example than just web applications, there's a screenshot of the Grafana operator end-to-end -end tests. And since we introduced them to the project or made them uh, easier to work with and more consistent, contributors have been way more confident in submitting their changes since they know, okay, the end-to-end -end test passed. We are confident in merging that. I am confident that I did my job correctly and they show up here. And by having this way to easily spin up a test instance with real data, you simplify your end-to-end -end process by such a huge amount that you don't have to think about, okay, what data am I going to put for this test? And this other test, can reuse that data? No, you have your data model already. Just build some tests around what a user would do with that data. While we're on the topic of end-to-end -end tests, also use this as an opportunity to figure out how long your end-to-end -end tests take overall. Now, some variation in latency could come through uh, infrastructure issues, like the machine is overloaded. But if you see an overall trend as your end-to-end -end tests are taking longer and longer, there might be some performance issues in your application, and this allows you to easily identify them. Yeah, while we're on the topic of having readily available data, another side effect of that, you can provide live demo instances. Obviously, again, this is more for web-based projects where you can just host it on a random machine. But it could also be useful in some other contexts, like there are uh, services which allow you to provision virtual machines with a shell for the user to toy around with your system. I even saw some uh, projects, uh, especially programming languages, building a dedicated WebAssembly target so you can try out the programming language without even having to install it on your local machine. If you can build something like that, that is very, very useful. Also, as a reference documentation, again, you can have your examples in there. You can show them to your user and they don't have to, again, have to put in the mental overhead of oh, where do I download this? Where do I get the data from? What kind of file do I need to save this under? They can all try it out live. 
Now, while building live demos, make sure they're opinionated and they're not just, again, useless foo bar ASDF values, because in the end, users will see your demo and they will take what they see in the demo and replicate it in their own environment. Coming back to the demo dashboards example, we could have just made a dashboard with all kinds of nice graphs and it provides, to an experienced person, this provides the same value, just having the graph there and they will figure it out on their own. But we took some extra time to additionally annotate that data and make sure that people understand where this data is coming from, how is it visualized and how can we use this. Now, obviously, if you provide a live instance, that always comes with a risk and that risk is usually people messing it up. Happened to us as well. So this is our public play.grafana.org instance. It's a live instance where anyone was able to create any dashboard they want to for over a year, and as you can see, it got kind of messed up with over a thousand empty dashboards. Nobody knows who this comes from. Is this used by someone? Do they still need it? Are they just creating it? Make sure that doesn't happen, and the easiest way that doesn't happen is to just kill your instance. Just keep on deleting stuff until your software is back up. Do this on a schedule. Make sure like, okay, my typical user exploration session takes around half an hour. Restart your system every hour. You have your test data. You have your way to quickly start an instance. Make sure you make use of it. And by that, you prevent all kinds of issues like people uploading malicious files, compromising the environment. Just restart it. You don't care about the data. You just want to show that you have some data. And yeah, oh, while we're on the topic of live demos again, a nice benefit is that, especially for web again, if you have a demo environment, you can introduce some lightweight analytics to see which pages are users, users visiting. And that can help you drive where you should focus more effort on in development. You can also discover like onboarding issues early on if you add a cool new feature, but nobody is actually trying it out you might want to consider placing it somewhere prominent, driving some marketing around it. So this is a really useful tool to gain insights into your users as well without them having to surrender their own information from their private instances at, at home. So that's a, a nice way to gain insight here as well. Now, there are some other topics for developer experience which are not as closely related to play, which I still want to mention since I've already trapped you in this room. Um, I can't tell you how to best structure your code. That's something you need to figure out with your team to figure out, do you want to continue using this library? Do you want to switch to a reactive style? Just want to put the thought into it. Maybe it's time to reconsider. Maybe bring it, bring it up in conversation. Would it be more fun to work on this project otherwise? And obviously, would it be reasonable? Like, don't rewrite your software just because I told you it could be more fun. And while you're there reevaluating choices, make sure you document your choices as well. So you don't only need to document technical aspects, but also some aspects around uh, why did we choose this way? Otherwise, you will get pull requests uh, completely reversing your whole style just because you didn't document why you chose, it, chose to do it that way. You can do RFCs. There's also the terminology of architecture decision records. Those are all tools which help you to codify what happened in the history of the project. Other cool documents to have are style guides. If you have a, uh, so some programming language have an implicit style guide like Go or Zig. Rust, I think, has one as well. But if your language doesn't have an official style guide, make sure you document how you want people to write their code. Make sure they know how, what is expected of them, what kind of quality testing. And another, yeah, just make sure they know what is expected of them. Another really helpful document, this is more for maintainers directly. It's a release process documentation, something which bites, bites me all the time. I want to re-release a new version and I have to check out my old commits to figure out what files do I need to change. Document that somewhere because in the event of you leaving the project or someone else taking over or someone else needing to do a emergency release while you're on vacation, you want to have that documented somewhere. Now, the important document, the most important document in my opinions, uh, in opinion are contribution guidelines, however. Because contribution guidelines give first-time contributors the confidence to know uh, this is the process I have to follow to get my changes merged. This is what I have to do. This is where I have to submit my changes. This is how I have to label my pull request. Do I even have to send a pull request? Should I send it to a mailing list somewhere? 
make sure you know you you tell your users how you expect them propose to propose changes. It can be as simple as, yeah, we're still figuring it out ourselves. Just send us a pull request and we'll discuss it there. It can be as complicated as you have to follow these strict commit messages, you have to follow these testing guidelines, you have to sign a uh, CLA or a DCO, which are uh, legal terms. Uh, make sure this is documented somewhere. Because otherwise, some people might just, yeah, OK, this looks like a cool issue to fix. And at the end, they figure out, OK, they don't actually want those changes. And now I did all of that for nothing. At least have a way to have people contact you. Uh, one thing I saw very often is the project proposing, if you are planning to make a large change, open an issue up for it first. We don't want you to spend your time working on something which will never be merged anyway. So yeah, contribution guidelines, use them. Make sure they're up to date. And make sure you follow them yourselves, because people learn by doing. And if you mess up your, if you push to main every time and nothing really makes sense, then people would just also ignore the contribution guidelines. One other fun thing which you c should consider, since we're most likely all of us in IT, or at least IT adjacent, make sure your users actually know how to use your software. Your target audience might be developers, but that's not for sure. You have a lot of projects on GitHub, and users will end up on your GitHub page, and they will complain how to install your software since they don't care about the code. Those are not isolated incidents. This happens very often. Make sure your users actually know how to use your software, even if that means contacting a distant relative who lives out in the woods. Tell them, hey, can you please try to set up my software and tell me if this works for you, if you can get this up and running. And don't help them. <laughs> Have them tell you what went wrong afterwards. Just something to consider. Consider working with package main maintainers. Consider working with distributions to get your packages to your users as easy as possible. So yeah, uh, what does the data say? Does this actually help in any reasonable way? And for that, going back to the demo dashboards example, we have set this up for new cloud customers. And we tracked if they continued uh, interacting with our software at a higher rate than those who have not interacted with the system. And for the first day, this looks actually pretty bad. So the red line up top tells us how many, uh, what's the percentage of users that continued, uh, that got, oh, what's the, what's the correct term? That got some value out of your software. This could be, in the case of Grafana, connecting an external data source, building their own dashboards or installing a plugin, so something which is not related to the demo itself, but some meaningful engagement in some other way. So on day one, people that interacted with that had a lower percentage of doing more, which kind of threw me off at first. I was thinking, yeah, maybe this isn't really worth doing after all if the people then just going to realize, well, it's shit anyways, I won't continue using it. Day one, so one day afterwards, still lower. But after a week, it turns out that people start coming back more often, since they have that initial learning frame where they can explore without messing anything up, without being afraid that they are going to break anything. After some initial learning time, they will start to come back. And over two weeks, the percentage is significant. Now, this is just a short time frame, and we haven't had much time to have a more large-scale discussion. This is coming up soon. But our initial findings is that it improves user retention over the long term by having them explore early on. And then there's one missing thing. Yeah, that's all I have for you today. Uh, if you have any questions, I think we have around five minutes. And yeah, other than that, visit us at the Grafana booth up top if you want to talk about observability or developer experience. Thank you. Yeah, any questions? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. um, how would you actually do this? So the, so the question was, how do we identify pain points? Pain points are usually explored by either talking to users directly, listening to people evaluating our software uh, for the first time, or just really going into the software yourself, dogfooding your own software to develop your own software, figuring out what took them so long. The best approach I know is really 
talk to a different team in your organization, have them go through the onboarding steps themselves, don't help them again, just have them go through this and figure out what are the times that took them so long or what would you have done differently to them. And maybe there's some issue in getting the mental model of your system across or getting uh, the correct tooling installed. Maybe it's an issue for like documentation. Write that down and then repeat that process again and again. Obviously not with the same person since they will have experience again, but really getting the insights of people trying your software out for the first time, that's the most valuable pain point detector, in my opinion. Oh yeah, another question. Do you have any experience of hosting office hours for something kind of similar to George Yes. Yeah, so the question was if uh, we have experience hosting office hours. I know of some Grafana projects that do, like uh, Alloy, I think, does it, uh, Loki does it and they have some very technical uh, discussions in there. So for larger projects, I would recommend doing them since it allows, again, another contact point for potential contributors to go there without any, with, with low stakes and just ask their question. But for most smaller scale systems, this could, this could also be intimidating if you have like a very close knit community and you have to join a random call. So I don't have any data on that. I would certainly see it as a valuable addition to tools. We're trying it out with the Grafana operator as well, but so far nobody has joined yet, but you still need to figure out a way. And even if it's just, so coming back to the Grafana operator, we have our weekly sync call. And if you notice that someone in your community is trying to contribute, just invite them. It doesn't need to be a formal office hours thing where you have a bunch of people on, but for specific pull requests, it sometimes makes sense to say, hey, this is a really, really cool thing. It seems like a big, contribution, would you like joining us into our weekly sync and just checking out uh, if we can get some more insight on what you're proposing? So yeah, I, I know it's kind of not an answer, but I think <laughs> maybe it's, it was useful as well. <laughs> so you, you talked a bit about analytics. Yes. Do you have statistics on your documentation? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so the question was if we have any analytics on documentation usage, and we do, and that was actually also very valuable insights. Uh, one tool I developed, which was conf uh, configuration generation for a specific tool. The first thing I did was take a look at the documentation analytics and saw which subcomponents had the most traffic, since this is apparently the fi those are the things which users are mo most interested about. So I took a look at those anal analytics and used them to prioritize tasks in which order I should implement specific subcomponents. So that's how we use documentation analytics. The other part of documentation analytics is figuring out if your docs are actually useful to people. And for that, you can have either calls with users directly or like little feedback buttons on your documentation. Was this page helpful to you, yes or no? All right, done. Thanks again for choosing my talk over the other developer experience talk and yeah, have a nice rest of your conference.